to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. So, Reed, today we are going to wrap up this series that we've had going this whole month about fitness and the culture of fitness. And we're going to do that with an interview that I did with my boss and the CEO of Barbell Logic, the source of the company, the founder, developed the whole process, the whole system, and really the driving force behind everything that the company does. It was such a pleasure to interview him, to speak with him from this perspective. I mean, I get to talk to Matt all the time. You know, he and I chat on a regular basis. Like I said, he's my boss. So I work for the company. So this was not a new thing, but it was new in that we were having this conversation specific to the Air Force and how we can use some of the things that Barbell Logic has learned in the creation of strong, healthy people, but most importantly for the purpose of today's episode, how to create a culture of trust, which you and I have talked about before, but bringing in this fresh perspective is really useful. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think there's some things on the back end I'm really looking forward to discussing with you And once our audience has heard the interview with Matt. Awesome interview. And I look forward to re-engaging with you, Colin, and talking about some of these ways we can use this lens of fitness to talk about a broader and probably more important subject, and that's trust. Yeah, absolutely. Fitness really is important. We've talked about that this whole month, but here is the capstone. Here is the crowning discussion for this whole thing that is building a culture of trust on that foundation of fitness. Okay, so from that, let's turn it over to Matt Reynolds. Matt Reynolds, welcome to the Air Force Officer Podcast. I am so excited to have you here today. Thanks for having me, man. I'm excited to talk on your platform for a change. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. So up to this point, the audience has been listening to the military series, so they are no stranger to you, but I think there's an opportunity here for them to get to know you just a little bit better, sure. give you the chance here to talk a little bit about who you are, where you come from, your professional background, and everything that has kind of led you up to this point. Sure. I grew up actually the son of a poor Baptist preacher, and which I actually think that matters to tell as part of the story because I often say when I talk to people about my upbringing, I had a wonderful family, great mom, great dad, great family. We were close, but I felt like I was utterly forgettable. Like I was the kind of guy that I think a lot of people, if I went back to my high school reunion, would be like, ah, I kind of recognize that name, but can't really, I was just painfully average in every way. So yeah. <laughs> um, I was pretty smart. And I only say that because I feel like I was because good grades came relatively easy to me. I did well on the big tests, you know, the ACT type tests and standardized things. Right. And so maybe I had some reputation there for being just a smart kid. I was kind of a goody two shoes growing up. I was really into sports, but wasn't great at them. I was at a pretty good size high school. I usually started the sports that I played, but I was definitely always the worst starter on the team. And I could always look at the bench <laughs> and say, man, there were definitely two or three guys that are better than me. Yeah. And I think I just worked hard and enjoyed the work. And I've always enjoyed the practices and always enjoyed mm -hmm. the training in the weight room more than the actual competition. I love the games. I would get up for the games and I would try to rise to the occasion. Felt like I did those things well, but I was never the star, never the star. Yeah. I'm super competitive in everything. I mean, I'm competitive to a fault and sort of always have been. I've got a younger brother three years younger than me, but I was a little small growing up and he was bigger growing up. And so we were close to the same body size. Yeah. And he played sports with my friends. And so it made him dominate everyone his age, but we were competitive in, it didn't matter whether it was basketball or ping pong or mowing the lawn <laughs> or like who was best at it. And with him, and to this day, he's a very successful businessman. He's actually retired. He got to retire at 37. So he beat me there. 
because I'm still working at 42, but I was just super competitive. I got out of high school. I wasn't good enough to play any college sports. I had just discovered weightlifting, just a strength training, barbell-based strength training as a senior in high school and was decent at it, surprisingly decent. I went to a high school competition. It was more like an NFL combine style thing yeah. than it was like a powerlifting meet. And I did really well. And I remember thinking like, whoa, I'm actually okay at this, having no context for what was good or not. Right. So I got out of high school and I got into college and I was going to school to be a teacher to get my education degree, which I've got. And in that process, discovered the sport of powerlifting, which was just a sport where you basically got to lift as heavy as possible and also put on as much weight as possible. So, you know, just you could <laughs> right. eat junk and I was eating McDonald's and pizza and soda and crap and I would not go back and do it the same way. Right. But at the time it felt awesome when I was 19 years old to be able to just gain a bunch of weight. So I graduated high school as 155 pounds. I'm about 6'1". And within about a year and a half, I was 240. <laughs> and so... <laughs> uh, I learned how to eat and learned how to lift. I don't know that that was all a great 240, but I wasn't too fat and started competing in powerlifting and did okay in powerlifting was again, not the best, probably a little better than I was at the sports I played in high school. I totaled the elite, which is the kind of top level total that you can get in a couple different weight classes, I think in three different weight classes. And so as I gained weight, I would do well there. In 2005, I turned my attention to the sport of strongman. I just thought strongman looked really cool. And I was kind of bored with doing the same three lifts all the time. Yeah. And so I started competing in strongman. And I actually, for the first time ever, found a sport that I was, I seemed to be naturally good at. And so, of course, back then in 2005, this is before CrossFit or, I mean, now you can go to gyms in any town and they've got strongman stuff. They got stones and yokes and yeah logs to press but back then there was nothing and so as a matter of fact i can remember going one time and and uh hopefully this will be okay on this podcast i remember going to a ymca that had a huge drainage kind of hill ditch that had these massive limestone rocks and going up there late at night one time with my brother and putting these limestone rocks on a i mean massive like 250 pound stones yeah and stealing like three of them we put them on a beach towel <laughs> and we would pick up you know each side of the beach towel and try to throw them put them in the back of my truck and we would train with these like actual limestone rocks rather than we didn't have the atlas stones or anything yet and so um yeah so i started competing in 2005 i went to kansas strongest man i won my first i won kansas strongest man training for three or four months at the time and i remember not having a very good day at kansas strongest man and still winning and thinking to myself wow i might actually be yeah i might be able to be okay at this and so continued to compete all through 2005. And then in 2006, decided to pursue my pro card. At the time, there were only two new pros in the United States a year that would win. Basically, you went to these big kind of a pro-am show. So you would compete with the pros and the top amateur would win their pro card. And the person that got second got nothing. Okay. So you might go to a big pro show and there'd be all these pros and you might take sixth or seventh, but it was the highest ranking amateur, so you would win. The one I went to, they had actually divided up. They had so many people that showed up, and I was actually there in Salt Lake City. Beautiful, I remember, it was the first time I ever went to Salt Lake City. Beautiful city and surrounded by the mountains, and yeah, they actually divided up all the amateurs, and we competed, I believe, on Friday, and then all the pros on Saturday. And I did really well and beat everybody. I went into the final event and all I had to do was pick up, load one stone out of the five. I would get enough points to guarantee my win. And so I won my pro card in Strongman and I competed on the pro Strongman circuit for about three years, three, four years. In the process of that, I needed a place to train. And so I opened a strength gym in 2008 okay. called Strong Gym. And it was just a barbell based gym, but we really focused on, and this is really where some of this where I am today started to become, started to kind of mold. I recognized that there were a handful of kind of hardcore powerlifting strength gyms in the world at that time, 2008. And remember, this is like the year that CrossFit broke out. So you're starting to see more CrossFit gyms and industrial buildings. And I built that gym and we had great training equipment and we had great training style. We were training heavy and like powerlifters, but we figured out that if we made the gym really clean and we treated everybody really nice, and weren't walking around with a chip on our shoulder, then we started to see more and more like soccer dads show up at the gym and then their wives would show up at the gym and start to train. And, yeah. and so we were able to take that barbell-based strength training, powerlifting style training, strongman style training, and carve a niche for ourselves in my city. And it's a city of about 250,000 people, so not, not real big. Right. But probably the perfect size for a gym like that because 
anybody in the city could get to that gym in 10 minutes, whereas in a big city, it, you know, it's sprawled out too much. And so that gym grew and grew, and I continued to work on business and coaching and ended up transitioning in that process away from being a the competitive professional athlete. I think I had enough street cred for having won my pro card to people would trust me with coaching that I had the experience and just focused on bringing a great experience and customer service to our actual clients. And it worked. And so, you know, the first location in the gym was just a, you know, a junky industrial building. It didn't have any heat or air conditioning. I can remember there were broken windows, but we just made it as clean and nice as we could. And eventually enough people came that we were able to move up to the next spot and then the next spot. And eventually we opened a 15,000 square foot. We bought a freestanding retail building in the downtown heart of the city, the kind of gentrified area and did great. So I learned a lot about myself as a leader, as a boss, how to deal with employees, how to not deal with employees. Times when I thought I was doing a really great job. And then later I'd look back and thought, man, I was awful. Right. And I was a kid, you know, I was in my late twenties at the time. And most of my employees were college guys and they were, you know, 19, 20, 21 years old. And so that was a tough, tough age to sort of lead, but I learned a lot there. And so 2015 I had the opportunity to sell that gym and I started full-time online coaching. And, and the piece with the online coaching that I saw was that by that time, 2015, online coaching was becoming a very big industry. And yeah, I felt like nobody was actually coaching. Yeah. Everybody was selling programs. Everybody was selling templates. Everybody was selling like nutrition templates, things like that. Nobody was actually coaching. And I thought, why can't you coach? And so I started doing this, you know, full-time out of my house. I was very lucky. I was coaching at the time, Brett McKay from Art of Manliness. And Brett had me on his podcast, which is a massive, you know, just 3 million downloads a month. Yep, for sure. Yeah. And talked about my philosophy and coaching him and he was getting strong and people were noticing that he was putting on muscle. And so almost immediately when that podcast launched, I was getting 25, 30 emails a day for people that were interested in my services. And so that gave me enough of a base to sort of build that online coaching business. And that was all myself at first. And I didn't really know where that was going to go. But as time went on, I realized I started to realize like I'm building a pretty good system here. And I was good at writing systems and standard operating procedures and the kind of stuff that would either appeal to or at least be familiar to your listeners. You know, the military is so they've got a standard operating procedure for everything. Exactly. Yeah. And for us, it became I watched mom and pop business owners do everything. Like they cleaned their shop, you know, they were the owner, they were the manager, they were the technician, they were the custodian, they were the everything. And I thought, I'm never going to be able to grow this business if I'm doing everything. So I've got to figure out how to write systems for this and then start to give those systems away to people. And I learned that at Strong, did the same thing, right? We learned how to clean the gym and wrote a system for cleaning the gym and then hired a custodian and then did the same thing for front desk staff and then other coaches and a gym manager. And I started to do the same thing with online coaching. And started to bring on, at the time, I had great relationships with some of the best coaches in the world. And so I decided I figured out how to scale it. And we kind of made a massive jump in December of 16 and added 30 staff members with no idea if people were going to sign up and went after great coaches that I knew and had core values that we stuck to and expanded in December 16. And it worked. And it's just continued to grow from there. And so now one of the largest online coaching companies in the world, I think we've got 80 staff members and 60 or so plus coaches. And we just continue to focus on really good service. So we've got these great technician coaches and that comes with experience. But for us, it's really about the value system of being able to build trust with our clients and being client centered, personal. It's not one size fits all. We try to meet our clients where they're at. And so that's just continued to grow. And it's been just a a joy, my team, and you're part of the team at Barbell Logic. Full disclosure, I guess people probably know that. Yes. <laughs> you know, I constantly think about the quality of the team that we have and how this isn't, I could have never done this on my own. I'm grateful that I had the right business mentors early to kind of write those systems. And I got lucky with finding the right people, but the business has just been outstanding. So I really went from lifter to primary coach known as, you know, I went from a competitive lifter to a coach and now I'm the CEO of the company and that's where the challenge is for me now. So I really enjoy running the company. I still, I still get to coach some, Mm -hmm. I do that. So we stay sharp, everybody that's on staff and all the VPs and leadership all still coach a little bit. So we keep our sharpness and we want to know what we're asking. We want to understand what we're asking of our coaches. And so we do that, but I've just moved from one challenge to the next, the challenge of competing and lifting 
to the challenge of coaching, which I've now coached since about since 1998. So 20, 22, 23 years at this point, I've coached, you know, that teaching degree <laughs> is not being used. <laughs> yeah. I went and got my master's to be a principal. Uh, so I have a master's in education as well. And, you know, here now I run a strength coaching tech company, but it's been great. So yeah, that was not the short version, but there you go. There's the entire background of Matt Reynolds. Yeah, not the short version, but definitely shows us the arc that you've gone through to get you to this point, as well as gives us a foundation to have this discussion around building a culture of trust within the company. And you mentioned how there are over 80 staff members, full-time employees, coaches that work for the company. And then there's the over a thousand clients that have given their trust to Barbell Logic for us to make them stronger, make them more healthy, to get more out of their life. And it's there that I want to focus our conversation today. Sure. The process that you have gone through to build that culture of trust. But before we can even get there, I think we need to define what do we talk about when we say trust or culture of trust? Because that there is going to lay the groundwork for the rest of the conversation. Yes. So Matt, when I say trust, what is it that you think of? Yeah, that's a great question. We talk about this a lot. I actually just had I interviewed a friend and colleague of mine, his name is Brett Bartholomew, who owns a company called The Art of Coaching. And he's written some books on this sort of thing, and he calls it buy-in. And so I don't wanna just steal that and use it as my own. I wanna give him some credit, but it's really that art of building buy-in from your clients. And so there is so much involved in how to do that. Well, in the fitness industry, everyone knows personal trainers who have no clue what they're doing, right? In these big box Globo gyms, and there are a lot of people who are just skating by in life with doing the absolute bare minimum. Somebody likes to work out, so they decide, I want to make money helping other people work out, but they don't really yeah. put in the work and the effort to gain the knowledge that they need to really distinguish themselves as different or, or more knowledgeable than all of the other personal trainers on the planet. So, but then there's another step to this, which there are other really good, high-level, technically proficient strength coaches out there who do not work at Barbell Logic. And it's okay because just because you're very proficient and very knowledgeable and read all the books and done all the things doesn't mean that you're a good cultural fit. Right. And for us, I don't want to leave behind the value of having that knowledge and having that experience. I mean, we pursue expert professional coaches. You have to be an expert professional coach to work at Barbell Logic. Mm -hmm. But not just that, not just that. Because after that, and the thing that we really mold with the culture is that building buy-in, building trust, making sure that we connect our client to the right coach. One of the big advantages we have in the market is that because we have one of the largest talent pool of coaches, yeah, we can, rather than back when I was the only coach, Reynolds Strong, right? And everybody's, I'm coaching everybody. There's tons of demographics that I'm not great at working with. Right. But at Barbell Logic, we have the ability that when a client signs up and it is a high trust purchase, it's a relatively expensive purchase. Certainly, we think it's worth the value. For sure. Our churn is very low with our clients. Most of the time, our clients come in and they stay forever. One of the reasons that we're able to do that is because we're able to connect clients with the right coach for them. Mm -hmm. And so the client signs up, they fill out a pretty extensive questionnaire. We find out about you know who they are, what they're trying to accomplish, what their goals are, what their background is, do they have injuries, and we connect them with the perfect coach. And so that very nature of online coaching by its nature, because it's online, is impersonal. Yeah. And what we've done is we've tried to do everything we can to make it personal. So we connect you with a coach that you would be friends with, you'd wanna go have lunch with if they weren't your coach. And so it's just that much better at being able to connect you with the right coach. So we start there with that connection and then the coach does everything they can to serve the client and be client-centered business. And then the other part of this that I think gets lost a lot of times in businesses is we spend as much time, you know this, we spend as much time as a leadership team making sure that we serve the staff, that our staff experience is outstanding, that right. we want happy staff. We want staff that make good money per hour. We want staff that enjoy working at Barbell Logic. The flexibility of doing online coaching is wonderful. You can, your coaches can get up in the morning and open up their laptop and they can drink coffee and sit in their underwear and work if they want to. <laughs> and the clients, likewise, they can train when they want and where they want and with the equipment they have. They can train at a Globo gym. They can train in their basement gym. They can train in their garage. We love home gyms. They can train in Afghanistan. That's right. And actually, that's been a huge boon for us is that 
gosh, we love our military clients for a couple of reasons, but one is the fact that they're just great at taking instruction for, for lack of, you know, they've done it for so long. Yeah. And so when they make a decision and like, hey, you're the experts, I'm going to hire you as my strength coach, and I'm going to be in San Diego for the next three months, and then I'm going to be in Germany for three months, and I'm going to Afghanistan for two years. We can train them through all of those. Right. And that's what's nice is it doesn't matter where you are. Everyone has a cell phone. You know, 99% of the time there's a cell phone. And even I've been to Haiti in the middle of nowhere. And yet if I stand up on the roof, I've got cell service and I can call home. Yeah. And you can video yourself doing your workouts and you can upload it to your coach. So we've tried to tear down all that or remove all that friction for our clients to be able to build that buy-in. So yes, the experience matters. Yes, technical proficiency matters by our coaches, but they've got to be a good cultural fit. They've got to be part of that. If they don't know how to communicate with people and be empathetic and make sure the clients feel heard, they're not going to be a great fit for us. And so whether that is, you know, the soccer mom at home or the female in college, 20 years old, or the grizzled veteran who's 48, we can match you with the right person. And we wouldn't put the same coach with those different demographics. Right. We've got coaches that specialize in that. So I think that's a big piece of it. I don't know that I would be able to build trust and build buy-in if I were the only coach, because I have my own demographic that I coach and I enjoy. And a lot of those I wouldn't be able to connect with on the same level. Yeah. And so just taking a little bit of a step back, knowing how important that trust is with your employees, with your coaches, how do you know when you have trust in them? What is it that enables that trust that lets you know that they are a good fit for the culture? Yeah, so we've got a pretty big process to be able to work at Barbell Logic, and it's actually worked really well because I very rarely have to interview somebody for a job. We recognized that the day was coming that the bottleneck was actually going to be in those expert coaches, those professional coaches yeah. who were cultural fit, that at some point we're going to have enough clients that the supply of great coaches were not going to be enough. And so a few years ago, we developed an academy, a coaching academy that's done very well. And it's, gosh, the goal of the academy was never to be profitable. It was about how do we make more great coaches that in the end would be able to work for us. And so yeah, we have continued to refine that process. That's now a six month online learning environment it goes very, very smooth. And we make sure that the coaches have the technical proficiency and the knowledge in that academy. And then they have to take a very intense test to show that they have the knowledge and the proficiency. And if they pass that, then we have a essentially it's an interview, an oral interview that my VP of experience, which in the past been the VP of HR, but she actually oversees all of experience for both our staff and our clients is Nikki Sims. And she was actually one of the first employees of the business. So she'd been with us for six years. We interview those people and it's a cultural fit interview. Yeah. It's not about, there's very little like X's and O's. Like we got that answer out in the written test. We just talk about the culture to make sure they're a great fit. And if they are a good fit, then we can bring them on and, and we then have an apprenticeship program that we have them work as apprentices under other professional coaches for at least six months before they become a full coach. So yeah, it's a pretty long process, but what it's allowed us to do is it sort of sets these markers all along the path of the potential coach where I can see for our students that are in the academy, the ones that work hard and dig in and do all their assignments and you know are, are very involved, I can see that, okay, they're going to work for this. Yeah. You can already start to see, like, they're probably a good cultural fit. You can see who is and who isn't. And then they take that written test. And you go, okay, they've got to make sure that they've got the technical proficiency and the knowledge. And then you do the interview and you make sure that they are a cultural fit. And then you don't just instantly make them a full professional coach. You make them an, an apprentice, an associate coach. Mm -hmm. And then I get to see how their work ethic is, how they fit with the team for a six month period or so. And then you get to that point where you're like, they're a good fit and you bring them on as a full. So it's pretty rare that I have to just go like, hey, send me your resume and let's interview yeah. for that. It's because we take it so serious that the relationship between the coach and the client is everything. And that's the single most important thing that we can do to keep our clients long term. And our clients stay on average, you know, 36 to 40 months, which is a long time to hire a coach. And so I think a lot of that too is we are trying to redefine what personal training looks like. Yeah. Most people, when they hear the word personal training, and not everybody, I'm sure, but most people probably have a little bit of a visceral reaction that you get this, you know, it's the super tanned, you know, frosted tip <laughs> hair guy with the purple polo and the BOSU ball. And like, that's not who we want it to be. And beyond just that, 
it's that it's expensive. You have to match your calendar, your time exactly with theirs. Like they're like, this is the only opening I have. It's 9 a.m. on Monday, Wednesday, Friday mornings or whatever. And if that doesn't work for you, you're out of luck. Right. And so trying to redefine that entire process of you can train where you want, anytime you want. Again, from whether that's in a suburb in the United States or Afghanistan or anywhere in between. And you're going to have a coach that's so much better than what you have access to right. in your little town, in your city, even for people in big cities. And, you know, that's the other thing is great coaches in New York City or Boston or San Francisco, they are astronomically expensive. I mean, we're talking $1,500 a month. Right. And so for one fifth of the cost or even less, you can be a part of Barbell Logic and have this personal coach that can coach you along the way. And you don't have to make the 9 a.m. time slot. Yeah. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, it's got that flexibility. What I love about what you've described here, the process of bringing somebody into the company, evaluating whether or not they are a good cultural fit is how well it aligns with what Reed and I have been discussing about what it takes to create an officer and someone who is ready to earn that, yeah. uh, that special trust and confidence of the commission. And as a reminder to the audience and for you, Matt, that we base that off of John Maxwell's The Law of Solid Ground, yep. the character, competence, and connection. And clearly, we can see that there has to be a connection. You have to be able to see that this person that you are looking to bring into the company as a coach and hire as someone who will be working with our clients, which are by far the most important resource that we have within the company, there has to be that connection. That's right. But at the same time, you want to know for sure that they are competent in delivering high quality coaching. And that's done through the academy, the test, but underlying all of that, there has to be this character, yep. this character that is primarily going to be formed through the process of becoming strong themselves. Yes. You're not going to just hire anybody. You're not going to hire anyone who has never put a barbell on their back. That's right. They have to have been refined by the process of barbell strength training and develop that character before you're ever going to let them take the test to prove their confidence and then make a connection with the clients of the company. And so I can see a perfect alignment there of character, competence, and connection that we talk about for earning the commission, very similar to how you become a coach for Barbell Logic. Yeah, that's a great point. And actually, you know, I kind of started with the academy, but where it really starts with our future coaches, most of our future coaches start as clients. Right. And they fall in love with strength training first. They're like, this is amazing. It changes their life for the better. We have a term we use in Barbell Logic we call voluntary hardship. It's that, just like you said, they're refined by that thing. There is, nobody's going to make you put a bar on your back and squat. And putting a bar on your back and squat is hard, really hard. Like one of the hardest physical things you'll ever do. Right. And it's not the only thing that refines you, right? There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of physical things that people in the military especially go through. There's a refining process to that, right? And so for us, though, we found that it's the most general thing that works for basically everyone. Yeah. Getting strong works for everybody. And we're not trying to turn people into power lifters. That's not the point, right? And we're not, as a matter of fact, our primary demographic at the business is just normal people. They're not competitive 22-year-old power lifters. Do we have some of those? Yep. But most of them are just normal people. They're, you know, they're business professionals and soccer moms and dads and military in all branches and first responders and cops and just normal people. They are refined through that process of strength training. And it changes their life so much that they want to help change the lives of others and then figure out how to proselytize that. And they figured out that the best way to do that is to become a coach themselves. And so we look at that entire client life cycle and say, like, they start as a client. A lot of times they start even with consuming our content. We put out a ton of content for free. Right. And, you know, we've got a really nice YouTube channel. We've got the Barbell Logic podcast. We've got great articles and eBooks. Just like the military series. That's right. All of that content is 100% free and will always be 100% free. The point is that that content, for people who are not able to hire us in our services, they can still get value out of the company and they can still, I want them to have a positive connection with Barbell Logic. Like, oh, Barbell Logic, they're the ones that make the great videos. They're, yeah. Matter of fact, I was at a, I was at a, yesterday was Memorial Day and we had people from our church over to our we got a little cabin and we hung out together and, and honored the men and women who have died and given them the ultimate sacrifice in Memorial Day. So we, it was, you know, we took it pretty serious. It wasn't a typical, like, let's all eat barbecue and get drunk. We sat around a fire and just talked and it was really good. 
but it was interesting people in my even like people in my church said oh you're like man i love the videos you guys make and they're not clients and they yeah they don't have the money to be clients and you know and so they get to get value there as well so you sort of establish yourself or you do establish yourself as experts in the field by putting out all this high quality content that anybody can consume and then some of those people some percentage of those people will become clients paying clients and then they continue to get refined or be refined by that voluntary hardship that comes with strength training and then eventually they decide i want to help others and so they start to go through the process of becoming a coach they coach their family and their friends their coworkers, and they often do it for free right. in the beginning that's what you have to do because you don't have any of the certifications or the experience but you're doing the best you can and you're probably better at it than the kid with the purple polo yeah and then you know you go through and slowly become as you gain experience you slowly become a professional coach an expert coach and then have an opportunity to be part of the Barbell Logic family or just do this on your own, whether that's in person, in a gym or, or somewhere else. So we think a lot about that client life cycle. But the important thing is that throughout that experience of starting to coach other people and wanting to help others get stronger, they are getting stronger themselves. They continually are being refined for sure by the barbell and training and showing up consistently and doing the hard work. That's right. And that continues to make sure that they eventually will be, at a very minimum, they at least have the character to fit within the Barbell Logic culture. That doesn't necessarily mean that they will, because right. they still have to demonstrate the competence and the connection. Sure. And that connection piece is obviously very, very important. But they at least have been refined. That's right. Their character has been refined, and they are a better person. They are a stronger person, having gone through all of that. That's right. I don't think I've ever met anybody who strength trained for the right reasons and later look back and was like boy i wish i hadn't done that right <laughs> everybody loves it right and there are people that train for the wrong reasons right and it's not even i don't even want to make it moral but you know some people train to get the girl some people train to get the abs and to look good on the beach and everybody wants to look better so there's nothing wrong with that yeah wanting to look better but if it's the only thing you do it's the only purpose of what you're doing is just is form not function like boy you're missing a big piece of the pie and for us, it's about function first, performance first, and aesthetics is a byproduct of that performance improvement. And we see that with all of our clients. They all look better. They all get leaner. They all get stronger. You know, the a paint with a broad brush here, but, you know, the females who thought that they might get bulky, instead their body responds the way they always wanted it to respond yeah. with the strength training, right? And it's not like you accidentally put on 50 or 60 pounds of muscle. That's not possible for men or women. And so it makes you a better service member. It makes you a better cop. It makes you a better fireman. It makes you a better parent. It often, I mean, we, we see this. I believe it makes you a better spouse. Mm -hmm. If you do it for the right reason, if you understand, if it's not about narcissism, but it's about I'm trying to refine myself and be better so that I can be a better citizen, so I can take part and play a better role in my entire life and the relationships that I have. And so, you know, I don't think strength is the most important thing in the world. There are other things that are more important, but it's way up there. It is important. And if we do it for the right reasons, it can really refine us and it can change our lives and our family and the people that we interact with. It can change them for the better. And so it's important. Absolutely. Yeah, we wholeheartedly believe that strength is important. But as you said, it is not the most important thing. What we do for our clients, why we want people to train hard either with us or on their own is we want to make them better wherever it is that they show up in life. Yep. As a parent, as a first responder, as a member of the military, as that mom or dad that is taking their kids to soccer, whatever it is that they are doing, having passed through the refining process of strength training, using the barbell, that voluntary hardship, that will make them better. And putting it into the military context specifically, Reed and I have talked all throughout this last month about why the Air Force has a fitness program. It's not about being fit to fight because the vast majority of members of the Air Force are not going to be in direct combat. Sure. Some will be, and it's really important that they are prepared for that. But for the rest of us who are working a desk or on the flight line or doing something that is not directly related to the projection of air power, it's about that cultural fit within the Air Force and being available when the Air Force needs you. That's right. And you can see how being stronger makes that more possible. Yes. It doesn't guarantee that you're going to be a cultural fit, just like being someone who knows how to coach someone doesn't guarantee you're a great fit for Barbell Logic. It doesn't guarantee that you're going to be available because some things can go wrong. You may find yourself in a car wreck that completely lays you flat and you're not going to be able to be available to the Air Force for a while. Yep. But 
it increases the potential for you to be a cultural fit and be available when the Air Force needs you. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, I think, like you said, it's that readiness piece. And it's not that everybody has to be a warrior all the time, but it's the way it affects your life, even outside the physical. The physical is huge. I mean, even thinking about, there was a study that came out a while ago, it's probably 10 years ago now, about even like the car accidents. Here's what's crazy. People that strength train, way lower mortality rate in car accidents. Right. Because you're less fragile. So you're building this anti-fragility. Well, how important is it for our service members to be (laughs) anti-fragile? Real important, right? Yeah. Especially for the ones who are going to fight. But it's beyond that. It's that what has been wild for us is the way it affects all of the other things. It makes us socially more healthy, mentally stronger. Those sort of things matter. And so as you talk about what an officer is or what an officer should be, in a lot of professions, and I won't say this specifically for the Air Force, you know much better than I do, but my guess would be there is some amount of paying your dues and being in long enough, and as long as you're not, you know, just a, a moron, then a lot of times you're going to continue to climb the ladder a little bit one step at a time. Right. But that doesn't make a leader. For sure. We've all had bosses or people who were above us who led that were horrific leaders. And we've also had the ones that we can go to and be like, man, that person was awesome. That person was a leader. And often the rank or the position in a business are the same. And you can still point out like that person really was a leader. Yeah. And this one just had the rank and we respect the rank. And we just again, it's not my world. I'm in the private sector, but I would imagine it's similar. And that's where this stuff comes in. So it's, you know, on one side, there are these people that do just enough to keep making the one step up the ladder every couple of years. And then there's the people who know that those promotions are going to fall into place if I just do everything I can to be the best person I can be. And strike training is a big part of that. And those are the people who end up, you go back later and you talk to people who are service members or you talk to people who are coaches. You know, we've got a lot of retired, I don't want to say ex, retired professional athletes at Barbell Logic that are clients, guys that are 45, 50 years old that used to be in the NFL or NBA. And they can all go back to a coach that they had, a strength coach, a position coach, and be like, man, that person changed my life. Right. And that's who we're trying to be. And strength training is just the modality that we use to be able to do that. But really, it's about the connection between the people. Absolutely. Well, great, Matt. This has been a really fantastic discussion. I feel like I have a much better understanding of the process that you take your employees through in order to make sure that they are a good cultural fit, how you continue to build that culture of trust. I mean, Obviously, I've gone through it myself. I am a coach for Barbell Logic. I work full time for the company. And so I've done it personally, but it's great to actually talk through what that process is, how deliberate it is, and the amount of effort and thought that you have put into building this culture for your company. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, you're a perfect example of exactly what I was taught. You started as a client, right? You were a paying client of Barbell Logic. I still am a paying client of Barbell Logic. Still a paying client. As a matter of fact, most of our coaches are, which says something I think as well. And then went through the process of learning what you needed to learn to become a potential coach, an associate coach, and do the apprenticeship and learn the thing. And then you pass, you become a professional coach for us. And then you start coaching. And then we start to see, oh, there's a, the cream continues to rise to the top, even among our professional coaches. And some of those people then become full-time employees, salary employees, leadership employees. And that's, you've walked through that entire process now. You're a member of leadership on the team and started as a client. I can still remember the first email you sent me years ago. (laughs) That you're like, hey, here's my background. Here's what I'm doing. Do you have a good coach to work with me? And I was like, in fact, I do. And I remember setting you up with that very first coach with Coach Emily. And, you know, and then it's just been off to the races from there. And it's not a process that happens in 60 days. Like this has been several years. I mean, how long, when did you start being a client at Barbell Up five years ago, probably. Yeah, started in 2016, right after you launched the thing. Yeah, so it's been really cool to see. And I love it because you're not the exception to the rule. Yeah. You're, this is like the process that most people can go through if they really want to pursue that. And so it's been really cool. And I think the same is true is for service members, that the vast majority, 99% of the people, you got, you know, there's a small percentage of people that just don't have their personality, they don't have any social skills, they're not able to communicate, and it's not even really their fault. It's like some people are just, they just don't have that, yeah. right? So occasionally you'll see that as well in the strength coaching world, just like, man, it's just never gonna happen here. But for the most part, and I've been really surprised, I've seen people that have gone through our academy that I thought, well, I don't know, I don't know if you got the right personality to do this, and then they've proven me wrong, Yeah, and I'm happy to be proven wrong. And so, and I think it's the same as you try to 
gain promotion and rank in our armed services to be able to work your butt off for those things and walk through that process. So very refining for sure. Yeah. So I want to give you the opportunity here to, obviously, we've been talking about Barbell Logic, but want to more deliberately plug the service that we provide specific for members of the military, sure. knowing that the audience here are most likely looking to join the military. They're preparing themselves to meet those qualifications for employment, the fitness tests and all those things. Yep. Some people that are listening are going to be currently serving and we'd love to be able to work with them too, but want to give you the chance here to plug our services for them. Where should they go to learn more? Who should they reach out to in order to become a client or at least start to learn more about our services? Yeah. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to do that. I mean, I would start with what I said earlier is that we've actually got a lot of free content out there. Yeah. And I tend to send people there first because you'll get to see if we're a good cultural fit for you. And so we've put out a ton of great content. We've got a ton of great content. I can say it's great content because I didn't write it, right? So if I wrote it, I feel <laughs> it'd be a little self-serving. A ton of great content on the military. So you can just, you can actually, we've got great SEO. So you can just Google search Barbell Logic Military. Yeah. You're going to see eBooks and landing pages. And we've got the military series on our podcast. Now you're reposting a lot of that here on your podcast. And so there's tons of great content out there for people who are just starting to, like they want to put their toe in the water. They're like, I'm not sure yet. Let's see. Like that's a great place to start. Yeah. And then we continue to work hard to be able to provide a service to our military members that is personal and professional and flexible so that anybody, wherever they are, can utilize our services, have an expert professional strength coach to walk you through this process. And so, uh, and that includes, and I want to be clear, one of the things that's different, and we almost treat our military service members almost like professional athletes. They're almost, because we're not just training them to be strong. Yes, we train all of our military members to be strong. Yeah. But we want you to be combat ready, anti-fragile, low injury, no injury, prep for the PFT. We want your PFT scores to improve. We want your, you know, waist measurement, neck measurement, those ratios to be right, body weight. So yeah. we take all those things. So it's almost like you're training a competitive wrestler or something. I mean, there's body weight management issues that we have to take into account. So that's why I think that one size fits all doesn't work. The way I'm going to train a business executive is not the way I'm going to train somebody in the Air Force. That's different. For sure. The coaches that we have for specific service members are service members themselves, which is also really cool or have been. Most of them still are. And so they know exactly the challenges that the service member is up against. They can understand based on where that service member is and sort of the history or the life of where they're at on challenges about, you know, like food intake. What Like there's a lot of stuff that you sometimes have control over and, and oftentimes you have no control over. Right. And so we work inside those parameters to be able to make sure that the service member can improve. But, you know, anybody can strength train and we walk you through it. You don't even have to have access to barbells. It certainly makes it better and will be a better return on investment. But we take a lot of time to meet our clients where they're at. We've got service members who come in. We'll get this a lot. They come in injured from something that occurred and, you know, and they've got the uh, you know, plantar fasciitis or a screwed up ankle or a bad knee or bad both knees bad back. or whatever it is, uh, a bad back, backs all the time. And we know how to rehab those things. And it's not about, we're not, you know, we do have PTs on staff and it's not offering PT service. It's more about yeah. a better way to think of it. It's prehab. It's not true rehabilitation. It's let's get the muscles strong around the thing that's broken or injured. Yeah. And make it so that there's less chance of re-injuring that thing and slowly heal that thing. And so that's the approach we take. Again, just like everything else, it's very personal and we focus on that connection. And so for our service members, we've got some things I think coming in the pipeline. We're looking at one of the things that's important for us is to collect data to be able to show the armed services yeah. that this works well. And we take privacy policy super serious. So we don't collect personal data for anybody but the aggregate data to be able to take and say, look at all of our military members and look at the improvement they've made in strength, look at the improvement they've made in injury prevention, look at the improvement they made in the PFT. Yeah. And the military loves data. They love numbers. Absolutely. So yeah. for us to be able to collect that, so we've got an incredible statistician that works for us and we've got our own app, we've developed our own software so that we can collect that aggregate data and say, this person's a service member. And we can see what the average increase is in squats and deadlifts and different lifts. We can see what the mm -hmm. average often decrease is in their waist measurement. We can see what their body weight does. We can see what their PFT scores do. And all of those things play a part of the game. And then that all comes back really to 
ultimately, what is that service members? What are their personal goals? Yeah, I mean, that's first Like you tell us what are your goals? What are you trying to do? And then we will match you with the right coach. And let's ferociously pursue those goals. And and you can learn anything about us. You can find out more at barbelllogic.com. Again, it's super easy to find us and we're Barbell Logic on all social media and whatnot too. But that's what I do. You, Google what you want. Barbell Logic military, Barbell Logic PFT. That stuff will show up on Google number one and, and start to read and consume that content. Absolutely. Great. Well, thank you so much, Matt. I've got one more question for you. Now, this one for our civilians tends to, it may not be something that you've thought a lot about. Oof. I'm nervous. But it's really helpful for us that are currently serving those who want to be an officer in the Air Force to hear what is it that our civilians think of or expect from their officers. Ooh. So the final question here is, what does it mean to be an officer? That's great. For me, as a civilian who doesn't have experience here, when I think of an officer who embodies what they're supposed to be, right? I think of somebody who's chosen to walk through that fire of voluntary hardship, wasn't forced to do it, right? You sign up, right. you sign the papers, you say, listen, I'm going to defend the Constitution, and you take your orders, and you understand what you're getting into when you sign that paper, but it's far beyond that. It's the person or people that decide, I'm going to go the extra mile to do everything I can to be the best service member I can be, to be the best officer, because eventually that experience will lead me to a place where I can lead others. And so I think that's what it's, and I, by the way, I think that's exactly the same thing if you were like, how could you become the best trash collector in the world, garbage man in the world? Yeah. Same thing, man. Like, okay, there's the minimum that you can do. You ride on the back of the garbage truck and you grab the thing and you throw it in. And you're like, but I think that we are called to this. Like we have a responsibility as American citizens to do everything we can to be the best at what we do. Yeah. And so the best at what you do as a military officer, that is a high position, an important position, a position that defends and protects the American citizens, our entire country. I mean, again, Memorial Day was yesterday, and I thought I read a quote, every single person on earth that's free has the American military to think, period. Doesn't have to be America. Like, freedom exists on earth because of what these men and women have done it. Like, we don't take that lightly. And so I'm thankful for the ones who have chosen to rise even beyond what they've been asked to do to be the best they can possibly be. So to me, that's an officer. I love it. Thank you so much, Matt Reynolds. This has been an absolute pleasure. Really great to learn more about you, about the company, how it is that you take somebody from being a client, if that's where they start, take them through that refining process, turn them into a coach, and potentially even become a member of the staff here at Barbell Logic. Awesome. Anything else that you want to share with our audience today before we get out of here? No, it's been great. So thank you so much for having me on the show. It's been a great conversation. And again, love to help out anybody we can. If somebody wants to actually talk to a real human on the other side of the internet, you're probably the best person to reach out to. So you can reach out to Colin yeah. C. Slade at barbell-logic.com. And he's happy to answer any questions whatsoever. I'll, I'll volunteer you, but you're kind of our go-to guy for Thank you. <laughs> answering those questions from military. And we love to hear it. So, you know, if you've got questions for us, he's a great resource for sure. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for putting this out, sir. Appreciate it. Hey, Colin, really good interview with Matt. I appreciated a lot of the things you said in there. And it may be easy for some of the audience to have maybe fast forwarded or tuned out because they're not seeing the application for them. And I'm hoping to yeah. bring that around full circle because there absolutely are things that anyone in whatever situation they're in can apply to where they are in their journey of to better themselves. And the first thing that I wanted to bring up, Colin, is he mentions a few times in there how the services that Barbell Logic provides are not inexpensive. Correct. He mentions that they cost money. And, you know, I've looked at that. You have been a customer, so you know how that works. For many, many years. Yes. yes. But there's a deeper concept that came to mind that I wanted to bring up and talk about with you. As he said, you know, how expensive the services can be. That when we pay for things, it is a signal of the value we place on that thing. True. Yes. There is also some degree of humility that goes along with that, that says, I cannot go to YouTube University and it will not satisfy my needs in some specific area. And so the thought I had, and I wanted to ask this open-ended rhetorical question to the audience, how much do you value closing the gaps that you see in yourself? How much do you value 
in improving yourself in X or Y or Z. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, maybe look at how many things that you are paying for Mm -hmm. and see what that says about your priorities. Do you have 27 different entertainment sources and subscriptions that you're paying for every month, but you don't have a single thing to make yourself better at your job? Right. You know, rhetorical open-ended question. But these are the things that I was thinking about as he was talking about fitness. I historically do well in fitness, but I'm not completely satisfied with where I am. Right. And so I'm asking myself, how much do I value fitness? Right. And so that open-ended question about value and, and how paying for something is an indicator of the value we place on something. Yeah. I mean, you're talking specifically in the context of the exchange of money, mm-hmm. but it's not just money. It's how do we spend resources? Yes. Could be money, could be time. How do you spend your time? Because, you know, some things that are very cheap, you know, for example, Netflix is not that expensive, but the amount of time that it takes is extremely expensive. And for what? What is the benefit? Yes, there are some really wonderful things on Netflix and Hulu and Disney Plus and, you know, you name the subscription, including YouTube University, completely free, right? Yep. So no money being spent there. But man, have I been sucked down the rabbit hole of like magic tricks and wood turning and some other things, you know, that are really interesting and fascinating. But do I come away a better person, a better officer because of that? Yeah. Probably not. Well, and before we get too far down this path, I want to make sure and say we understand the importance of, you know, mental health breaks, of taking a knee and relaxing, of connecting with friends and family over the water cooler about the latest episode of The Mandalorian, whatever it is, those are good things. Yeah. All I'm asking for and that I'm doing for me is an inventory of how much am I spending on, on the things that I'm doing? Are those priorities appropriate? I think we've talked about the Eisenhower Square on this yeah. podcast before. Which, by the way, is a personal favorite of Matt Reynolds. He talks about those things that are urgent and important in every meeting that I've ever been with him. Yeah. That is his thing. Yeah. It's a really great tool. Once you set up that square, and if you have questions, you know, Google Eisenhower Square for productivity, or, or there's a number of ways to get to it. But the key part is now write down everything you're doing with your time Mm -hmm. and then bin it, put it in the bins and find out just how much time you're spending doing things that are unimportant and unurgent. Yeah. And just balance it. Anyway, that's my first thought. Colin, what is something that uh, you wanted to talk about first? Well, just a follow up to that. This also includes this podcast. Like people are spending time listening to us. And why is that? Is it because that we are crazy, super entertaining. Like we are the best show that's out there, you know, high quality production, you know, pyrotechnics, great soundtrack, you know, those things that draw people's attention. No, not really. (laughs) So why is it that people are listening to us? Well, I think it's because they think there's something we have to offer and they have something to learn. And that is really the point of seeking out these different opportunities for growth and development is that there is something for you to learn there. And thank you very much to all of you who are listening and paying attention to us. It's not lost on us that you could be going other places to fill your time, fill your head with other really wonderful things. And it also shows a level of humility in being willing to go learn from somebody else. And that's one of the things that really comes across in the coaching and client relationship that I'm working with someone who has reached some point in their life, something happened that drove them, that humbled them in some way to a sufficient level that they were like, okay, I need to improve. I want to improve. I can't do it by myself. And so I'm going to value the service provided by a coach and be willing to listen to what they have to say. When that relationship clicks like that, when the mentor and the mentee come together, when the coach and the client or whatever relationship you want to use to describe it, it's really powerful. That teacher and learner type of relationship is really amazing. And that's really what we should be pursuing when we want to hire a service. 
whether it's an actual person and a coach or a subscription service like Masterclass or something like that, Audible, you know, anything that we are going to pay for with money or time, we should approach it with some level of humility and this idea that there is something to be gained there from the mentor, from the coach, from the teacher. That's really how we should approach these things. Yeah, I agree. And who do we want as our officers, Colin, when we're going through ROTC, when we're going through OTS? Mm -hmm. What were those huge red flags of maybe this person is not fit? Yeah. It's those people who were unwilling to learn. That was always a huge red flag for us when we were yeah. teaching at OTS. And not humble. Yeah, exactly. The two kind of go hand in hand, right? Yeah. yeah. There's nothing wrong with being good and being confident, but being excellent requires a level of humility and ability to learn. Yeah. Yeah, totally agree. So something you mentioned there, Colin, that kind of brings up the next thing I wanted to discuss is Matt talks about people that subscribe to his service that maybe don't have the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And he talks about that. And it made me think about something you and I have discussed a few times, so maybe haven't really delved into too much, is your why. Why is it that you want to commission? Why is it that you want to be going through these hard things? Why is it that you want to submit yourself to the refiner's fire of the barbell? And I don't know that I've shared some of the experiences I had with students who were clearly not there for the right reasons. So I'm going to just share very briefly a student that I had that was clearly not there for the right reasons. Yeah. And maybe if you've got some thoughts on that. So without going into too many details, this person was not performing well in pretty much anything. And when you're in a condensed, intense training environment, a poor performance is a way to attract attention and not yeah. exactly <laughs> the attention you want. Right. And it's one of those squeaky wheel gets the grease type of things. And, and that's not always good. And, you know, we tried to spread our training love around, if you will, sure. as instructors. But when a student is consistently failing to meet even basic standards, you start wondering what's going on. Pulled the student in my cube. There were some significant personal things going on in their life that were making the training even that much more challenging. But there was still something there that like, this is more than just this, this immediate family issue. And the more I dug, I found out the person was not there for the right reason. They were there because a parent essentially said, you are going to do this for your life. Mm -hmm. And when I inquired what this person had been doing, and they started to describe the profession they were in, they lit up. Like, you could totally see it. And the passion was there. All the things that I was not seeing in my training environment that I require of my students in order for me to put in the effort, if someone wants it and is put it in the work, I can get them there. Yeah. Overwhelmingly, I can get them there. But when that passion is not there, when that desire is not there, when the give a crap factor is zero, no matter how hard I push, I almost can't get them there. And it was an interesting situation for me to see someone who clearly did not have the why in the right place. We lost some students on the first couple of days, you know, every training program does. Yeah. But this was, you know, a few weeks in and it really made me think about, about the why. And when Matt brought that up and we've talked about it before, Colin, I think, you know, we were recently guests on One's Ready podcast. We also talked about how your why can change, Yeah. but you have to have one. Have you had students that we're clearly not in it for the right reasons. And how did that impact their training and their success? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like exactly the same scenario, but in ROTC where there is a parent who is a still actively serving officer okay, and made his son apply for a scholarship, which he won mm -hmm. and rightly so was deserving of it. But clearly throughout all training, throughout all academics, and in an actual paper, like he turned in to me to read, said that my dad is making me do this. I don't want to be an officer. Wow. I'm only here for the money. And <laughs> of course, I brought him in and had a conversation yeah. with him. Yeah. And it was like, okay, so what's going on? Well, I wrote it in the paper. It's right there for everyone to see. I don't want to be an officer. Well, then why are you here? Because mm -hmm. my dad is making me. Yeah. Okay. Well, what are we going to do about this? I'm not going to commission you if you don't want to be an officer. Well, I don't want to commission. But when he failed other classes and 
failed out of ROTC. It opened up a huge can of worms that it wasn't just the situation with the cadet, but his father made everybody's life a huge, miserable nightmare. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't just that the cadet wasn't there for the right reasons. The father, I don't think, was in it for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. I can't say because I don't know the guy, but I would venture a guess that he wasn't in the Air Force for the right reasons and was perpetuating this legacy of wrong reasons into his family, which then affected other people that the son had to associate with. And so you can see how doing something for the wrong reasons, even if it's a noble pursuit, can have negative repercussions on yourself, on the people you love, and your bigger sphere of influence. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Wow, that's quite the story. That's, yeah, I... And that's not even the half of it. Like, this was a multi-year saga. Yeah, I'm sure. Not just a couple of weeks at OTS. This yeah. was... And that's the benefit of a concentrated yeah. training experience. <laughs> I'll give you that. Good news story for this student. They left training to deal with that immediate and critical and important family situation. And as I understood, went back to their previous profession and found, you know, what they wanted to do. And I'm grateful for that. But again, you know, me, captain of the rhetorical questions today, what's your why? What is it? Is it changing? Which is fine. But does it still align with what you're shooting for right now? Yeah. And that falls right in line with your definition of success. Yeah. What is it that you're chasing? That is going to shape the character and the success of your Air Force journey. Yeah. And what a perfect thing to think about when we're talking about fitness. Right. Are you out there slogging it at 6 a.m. in order to get the 90 on your PFA so you just don't have to do two a year? Right. Or do you want to live a healthy life? Do you want to be an example for other people? Again, captain of the rhetorical questions. I'm just going to drop those grenades in the room and let you all think about them. And Colin, my why has not always been holy, right? Yeah, mine either, for sure. I have made mistakes. I have absolutely said, I just need to get a 95 so I don't have to do this thing again or whatever. I've been there and I have found that to be inadequate. We humans are capable of impressive feats of suffering. <laughs> you know, we can inflict a lot of damage on ourselves and others. And it's just not worth it. I'm too old for that crap. I can't do that anymore. <laughs> like, I, I just, it's not worth it. And it's not authentic to me. It's not authentic to the people I love and I surround myself with. So that's, you know, specifically for fitness, you know, trying to bring it back in to what we're all talking about here. What's your why? Why are you doing this? Is it just so you can get paid? Okay. It may not be enough to carry the day. Yeah. Well, let's take that rhetorical question of why do fitness and wrap up this discussion with one more thing that I think is really critical and the whole point of interviewing Matt to begin with, which is the creation of that culture of trust. Can you buy into the why of creating a culture within the Air Force where we trust each other because of that mutual understanding and shared experience of being fit, of pursuing something difficult, slightly out of reach, but not necessarily unattainable. And it's Therein that with barbell logic, we see this kind of microcosm, this example of what is possible when you have a group of people, both coaches and clients, who have that common foundation of fitness toward the end goal of building a high trust organization between the coaches, between the staff, between the clients. And to add to that, barbell logic is a 100% remote company. We coach online. We interact online. We don't get to be in the same room with each other on a regular basis, which is the typical way of connecting with someone. And yet, I feel like I could trust any one of the other coaches and probably any one of the thousand clients that the company has. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really interesting idea. And I wanted to talk about it too, especially in light of what something that Matt said he's able to do when a new client and a new coach come in, mm -hmm. he's able to, you know, he said, he mentioned there's a pretty extensive questionnaire. There's a process where you are matched essentially with someone 
that will help you achieve your goals because they have, you know, maybe some shared common experience or they understand your perspective or whatever else it is. They've specialized in working with that type of client, something like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, that's all in the special sauce of what the service that it is that Barbell Logic provides. We don't get to do that, Colin. There's no such thing as a you know, okay, hey, it's time for you to PCS. Here is a panel of squadron commanders. This one likes <laughs> long walks on the beach. This one went to your school. You know, like that is not this how one's this a Scorpio. Yeah, this, this one, yeah, that is not how this goes. And so, the requirement to here comes the show called not the Bachelor, but the Squadron Commander. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So, <laughs> but that's not how it works, right? And it's one of the hardest things to teach. Our students at OTS, and I know it was at ROTC, we've talked about this before, how teaching them how to connect, because you are going to have to connect with people that maybe you wouldn't pick. Yeah. When he was talking about how he does that matching, I'm like, that is not how this works for us. Right. <laughs> and yet, just like your business, it's so foundational, the connection. It's even more so for what we do. Yeah. And yes, we do hopefully get to be in person. I'm so grateful COVID seems to be trickling down, knock on wood, and we might be able to start having some of these in-person functions again. Mm -hmm. But I would also put that it is on the officer. It is on the leader who is responsible for creating the culture, who has the authority. It is up to you to find a way to shelve your interpersonal crap that is blocking connections from happening. Yes, individuals need to learn and grow at all levels, but connection. That is one of the most important things we have to do. It's got to be us. We've got to do it. Yeah. I mean, I've talked in the interview about how there's like this progression of the hiring of a coach and how it aligns with you know the commissioning of an officer, where you have this foundation of character that comes from who you are as a person and your experiences your commitment to the Constitution and the, how that aligns with Barbell Logics, you know, the refining process that comes from being under the barbell. And then on top of that, there is the competence that comes through lots of experience in coaching other people, going through the Barbell Academy. And on the Air Force side, we have our commissioning sources. We have the AFOQT, these assessments that show, do you meet the minimum level of competence required to receive that commission? But the capstone of all of this is that connection. Yes, you may be a wonderfully great, good character person. Yes, you may be the best stick in the Air Force. But if you can't connect to other people, if you can't relate to their experiences, if you can't have empathy, if you can't exhibit humility, then you're missing a huge third leg in that stool that is going to be the support for mission accomplishment leadership, managing resources, innovating within the unit, can't do it without other people. Yeah. Colin, I think we talked about this in some recent episodes. What's a readily available tool that we all have at our disposal in order to create these conditions where trust might occur? Fitness. <laughs> it comes up again. There he goes. And I know I'm being a little facetious, but the point I'm trying to get at here is we have built in opportunities that you and I have discussed in previous episodes, we don't think you're being taken advantage of enough. And there's something that happens when there's shared suffering. Yeah. You know, it happens on deployment. Yep. People go, they deploy, they have some lousy experience ranging from the AC is broken in their room to, you know, the tragic loss of a colleague or, you know, a failed mission or anything along the spectrum. And that shared suffering together with another person creates connection. Yeah. It creates opportunity. And if you're in garrison and you're not deployed, what is a tool that you have? You have fitness. You can do this. It's available. We all have to pass the PFA. We all have to be fit. Use this tool. It's available. Yeah. Let's remember, it's not about combat readiness. The vast majority of us are not going to see direct combat and that's okay. But we have to use the fitness program for what it is primarily intended for, which is creating a culture of high trust, health, and fitness so that we can all be available to the Air Force when called upon. Exactly. Colin, great interview. I really am grateful that Matt was able to come on and use his lens 
which is not one that we're used to bringing on, but I think that's important. I think it's important to get outside perspectives. And I think before we wrap up, I loved his answer at the end about what is an officer. Yeah. I wrote down, it's just extra. I put a little <laughs> smiley face, you know, just, but that's what people expect. They expect that little bit more. And I love that answer. Really glad Matt was able to join you for the interview. Absolutely. Yeah. Big thanks to Matt Reynolds for sharing his knowledge, his experience, his wisdom, and helping us to see the importance of creating a culture of trust and how we can go about it using the tool of fitness. But again, it doesn't have to be fitness. Any common ground that helps us to have that shared experience and connect with each other, that's truly what matters. And that's what I hope everybody will take away from this episode today. Awesome. Well, That'll do it. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of Commission Ed.